final webinar of this series. Um, so these have been provided by Cardamer Vale Health Board aimed at district and community nurses, but everybody is welcome and provided by Cardiff University and by my colleagues on the call. So today we're going to talk about end of life care issues. So we have got my colleague Capriona Seed from City Hospice, who's one of the clinical nurse specialists at City Hospice, who's going to talk about recognising dying and end of life care followed by Sean Tucker, who is the clinical nurse manager for the uh, South East of Wales from Marie Curie. And she's going to talk about the Cardiff and Vale Hospice at Home service. And then we've got Karen Fenner, who is also from City Hospice and is going to talk about bereavement and bereavement services. So as previously, um, all of the webinars are recorded for those of you who've registered but are unable to make it uh, live today. And the recordings will be available on the on the Cardiff University YouTube channels. Um, we would be really, really grateful for evaluation and feedback from everybody so that we can continue, hopefully, to provide webinars like this and to tailor the content. Um, and if you if you fill in the evaluation for us, we'll be able to provide those of you who are attending live with a certificate of attendance for CPD purposes. Um, thank you. If there's nothing else in the intro, I'll uh, move on and just do some polls if that's OK. So I think Charlotte was just going to launch some polls. Um, and we just want to ask people about their their main role and the setting in which they work. So if you're able to just click, click on the question for us to give us an idea of who's on the call, that would be great. Thank you. Can you see the answers to that, Joe? I can. Am I the only one that can see them? I'll read them out then. I have got uh, so far, I've got 11% district nurses, a third of people working in palliative care, a third of people from a nursing background and sort of 10% of people who are AHPs and 10% of people who are medics. From That's from nine responses. Thank you. And are you happy to launch the other one, Charlotte, which is about the setting in which you work? So community nursing home, secondary care, or mainly in specialist palliative care? I'll let you share those when we've got some responses, Charlotte. Thanks. Can you see those responses? I can. So we have got 30% of people working community, 20% nursing homes, 10% mainly secondary care, and sort of 40% of people working in specialist palliative care from 10 responses. Thank you very much for that. Just gives an idea who we're speaking to. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kat, if that's OK, to talk about recognising dying and end of life care in the community. Hi, thank you, Jo. So as she says, my name is Catriona. I'm one of the nurses from City Hospice, uh, part of the Specialist Palliative Community Team in Cardiff. So I just wanted to go through some of the issues surrounding recognising dying and how we can help fight end of life care in the community. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. So our main aim is going to be to be able to recognise a dying person and how to provide end of life care. We're going to hopefully cover how to identify when someone's coming towards the end of their life and why this is important. Hopefully identify some of the common signs and think about what we need to do to help support our patients at the end of their life. Obviously, if you have any questions or thoughts, um, please put them in the chat and hopefully we'll get to those after, after we finish the teaching. So recognising dying, why is this important? So looking at the uh, Office of National Statistics in 2021, um, over 30% of people are dying in their own home 
and that's across Wales and across Cardiff, with about 14% dying in care homes. Um, so there's an awful lot of people getting end-of-life care in their own homes. Now, some of these statistics will also cover people who have sudden events or something else that's going on, but a good proportion of these are going to be expected deaths where we're providing end-of-life care. A uh, leading cause of death in, in men is usually ischemic heart disease and in women with dementia, but I think actually the leading cause of death uh, for our patients are usually cancers and dementia. So why is this important? So it's really important to remember in healthcare that dying is a natural process. Um, it's not a failure in healthcare for someone to come towards the end of their life, but not and managing their needs and not managing their symptoms can be a failure if we don't get things right. So it's really important that we identify the, uh, someone's dying in a timely manner. It's really important that we inform the person and the people important to them. They may not be aware that they're coming towards the end of their life. And if we don't get that communication right at the right time, we can cause unnecessary distress. Uh, about 50% of all complaints to the NHS will be around end-of-life care and an awful lot of it comes down to miscommunication. Sometimes there's unrealistic expectations um, from either the person or the, the people important to that dying person um, and it's really important that we explore what the person's expectations are. We use sensitive, we use open communication to explore what they're expecting at this time and actually try and get people on board with the, the current situation. And obviously we want to make sure people's symptoms are adequately managed and we need to make sure that we're meeting people's cultural and spiritual needs. So hopefully you're all aware, I'm not sure if you will be, of these five priorities for care for the dying person. So these were initiated from the um, the reports that came out in 2014 following um, removal of the Liverpool Care Pathway back in 2012. So we have one chance to get it right. A, a document was done through the Leadership Alliance and they um, realised that the Liverpool Care Pathway was becoming a tool, tick sheet. It wasn't necessarily um, being person-centred. How do we get around this? So they came up with these five priorities. So the number one is recognition of the dying person. So unless we recognise that someone is dying, we cannot get things in place to help support them. We need to make sure that we're having sensitive communication between the dying person and the people important to them. We need to involve people in the, any decisions regarding their treatment and to the extent that they may want any treatment. We need to identify any needs of the family or the people identified as important to the dying person. And we need to make sure there's an individualised care plan uh, that will cover everything from make sure symptoms are managed to all intake to psychological, social and spiritual support. And it's make sure that all the care that we're delivering is given with compassion and with sensitivity. OK. So planning for the end of life is an ongoing process. So. As we're going out to see people, we may see people changing over time and we should be having conversations. And if you joined us last week where Karen spoke to us, uh, Karen Smith spoke to us about advanced care planning. This is why this is so important. So when someone's coming towards the end of their life, we know whether they would want to go into hospital, where their preferred place of death is. And are there any potential ceilings of treatment such as antibiotics or things like that? Um, it's really important when we're establishing if someone has a preferred place of death. I always like a plan B. Life, especially in the community, can sometimes throw us a bit of a curveball. And I think it's always important to have another option in case things aren't, aren't going to plan. Okay. So the general signs, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is the most common signs that you will see that someone is coming towards the end of their life. Um, and we'll, we'll go through each of these slides now in a little bit more detail. So the first one, ooh, if my, my thing will behave, so general deterioration. So it's not always obvious, and especially if you're going in to see someone and someone that you've known for maybe weeks, months, or sometimes even years, you may notice that over a period of time they get generally more weak, generally more frail, and this can happen quite rapidly over a number of days, or it can take time over over weeks or even a, a couple of months. 
You may notice that they need more help with assistance with simple tasks such as washing or dressing. And you may find that their mobility generally decreases and that person spending more time in bed. So it's their general overall um, frailty is becoming more obvious. Over time, you're probably going to see that they're going to be socialising less, that they become quite withdrawn. So they may not want to engage in, in activities that where they may have had interest before. You may find that they lose interest in some of their hobbies. If there's some they love the football or they loved music, they're taking less interest in that. And you can also find they don't want to engage the same with the people important to them. And that can be obviously quite distressing for loved ones. And I think it's a lot of the things around end of life care is about giving reassurance to families that some of this is actually perfectly normal. And what we need to do is just help support families and the people as they're, they're coming towards the end of their life. You'll normally see that there's a reduced oral intake and you usually see that become quite significant, particularly towards the end of life. This can be gradual coming, you know, they're eating small amounts and smaller, smaller portions. But we'll usually see that at some point people go where they're just eating a few mouthfuls, maybe just having a few sips of food, uh, of fluid. And this is perfectly normal. And it's really important for relatives that you make sure that they're aware that this is perfectly normal. So the body doesn't need the same level of food and nutri food and fluid as we do as it becomes to prepare itself for dying. So the organs aren't needing the same amount of, of energy intake and fluid intake. And this is perfectly normal. And it's that reassurance to the family that's so vital at this time. Um, one of the common questions you get asked is, is my loved one dying of starvation? Are they dying of dehydration? Do we need to give them IV fluids? And if you can explain to them that actually this is normal, this is part of the process of the body preparing itself for dying, then they've got that reassurance that actually this is this is OK. This is all part of the normal process. Generally, you find people are sleeping more. They may be um, more fatigued. So when they are awake, maybe they're, they're less able to engage because they're so tired. You may find they're just awake for very short periods. And over time, you'll probably find they become less responsive. Um, and over time, they'll, they'll become completely unresponsive. Um, we always say, despite this, that the hearing's the last thing to go. So again, it's reassuring families to talk with them, to put on music or have, you know, reminisce about stories or things that are important to the people um, is really important. And it's part of that bonding time when people come in towards the end of their life. You can sometimes see a new delirium or if someone's prone to confusion already, they've got an um, impaired cognitive and function. Uh, function, they may already have an element of confusion or agitation. You may find this gets worse at end of life. There are multiple causes um, and it is important if you're seeing some of these that we rule these out first, um, just in case actually there's a reversible cause for the change in deterioration. Towards the very end of life, we usually see a change in someone's swallow. So um, you may find that they're struggling to manage food, fluids, maybe they're struggling to manage medications. We usually find the swallow reflex becomes very weak at the end of life and it's usually a time when we start to think about rationalising medications and maybe considering giving uh, medications for symptom management through another route such as subcutaneous injections or as a continuous in, as infusion via syringe driver. So these are very late signs. So changes in breathing you usually see in the last hours and days of life. So you often see changes in breathing patterns. So you can sometimes see laboured rapid breathing. You might see very slow, shallow breathing. Sometimes you can get long pauses followed by the big dramatic gasp, which can be really hard for families to watch. And again, this is about reassurance. You can sometimes get noisy, rattly breathing, which is, some people call it the death rattle. I'm never keen on that phrase, but it is um, where the secretions, the ore secretions aren't able to be cleared by the person. So they tend to crawl around here and the person's breathing through them. It sounds dreadful. It often doesn't cause the dying person any distress. If it is, there are medications we can use to manage that. Again, it's reassurance to the family because it's not always a nice thing to hear. 
And a very late sign is trained Stokes breathing, and that's for, it's a very mechanical looking breathing. And hopefully you've all seen an example of this. Um, it's usually a very late sign that someone's got a very short space of time left. Um, I have seen instances where people have started chain stoking and then still been around two days later after stopping. But generally, it is a very, very late sign. And then signs of reduced circulation. Again, a very late sign. So someone's usually got hours to very short days at this point. This is where the obviously everything's shutting down, the heart is getting weaker, blood pressure is getting lower. So you tend to find that there's reduced circulation to the peripheries. So the legs might start feeling cold. You might find that they're changing colour, kind of sometimes get almost like the blood is pooling in the legs. Again, this is perfectly normal. Just make sure that they're comfortable. OK. So what do we do if we've we've gone to see someone and we're concerned that they might be at the end of their life? So the first thing we do always need to do is just make sure there's no potential reversible causes such as an infection or something's caused a delirium such as constipation or anything like that. So we need to have a discussion with the GP and see whether they need a review. Obviously, even if it's for reversible causes or we think we're dying, we, we need to get the GP involved anyway. If the person is already known to your community specialist palliative team, so if that's in Cardiff, it'd be City Hospice. Obviously, if it's in the Vale, that would be Marie Curie. Then obviously um, contact them and discuss any concerns with them. And if they're not known to the, your local um, community specialist palliative care team, if you feel that actually the input would be helpful, then do contact your local team to discuss a referral. If we've got any ceilings of treatment for, for the person, then we need to think about this at this time. So there will be some people who would say, I would like to try some oral antibiotics if I get a chest infection, but I don't want to be put into hospital. If that's the limit of the care I can receive in the community, I want to be made comfortable and I don't want any heroic measures. Um, I've actually got a lady who I've set up on a driver this week who's been prone to high calciums. And unfortunately, she's deteriorated, uh, gone out. Some clear signs that potentially she could have an either high calcium again. So she's been vomiting, remained quite nauseated. There's a few other signs that red flagged. But actually, she's generally deteriorated over the last few weeks. And after sitting with her and her family and having an honest conversation, she didn't want to go into hospital. She wants to be made comfortable. And it's having these honest conversations with people that is really important. Obviously, if we're doing comfort measures, if we're providing end of life care in the community, then we should be speaking with the GP about implementing the all else guidance care decisions for the last days of life. And that document is available on the NHS um, Wales Health Collaborative website. So what do we need to think about when we're providing end of life care at home? So obviously we need to make sure that we've got a package of care in place. So some of our patients in the community, sometimes they can be independent and there can be a sudden change and they may not have had any need for, for care at that time. So it may be um, that we need to speak to the district nurses about getting a fast track assessment done to get care in place quickly. And I know Sean's going to talk to us as well about um, some of the support that, that's there that's provided by hospice at home. If they've already got a care package, is it sufficient to their needs? Do we need to look at increasing it? Um, the most common problem at this time is carer crisis because they're struggling to support their loved ones uh, during such an emotional time. So we need to make sure we're supporting the family with this. Obviously, the hospice at home service do offer a night sit service as well. So do we need to think about um, taking the pressure off the family um, and seeing if we can access that as well? Do we have the right uh, equipment in place? Do we need a hospital bed? Do they need a commode or a bottle if they're a gentleman? Do we need pads in place? Sometimes this stuff is already in place, but sometimes things change so quickly that we're rushing to do it all um, at the last minute. We need to make sure if someone's dying at home that there's a do not attempt resuscitation form in place. Ideally, that should already be in place before a crisis like this happens, but it's not always the case for various reasons. If that's the case, if the dying person is able to engage in that conversation, that is the best thing to do. 
If they are not, it is a medical decision, but we should be honest and open with the family about the need to get one in place and the reasons behind it. Okay. And it's also important to sit with the family and just make sure they know what to do. So not just from getting help in as things change, but also what to do when the person dies. So calling the GP or the out of hours GP and not calling 999 and obviously letting the district nurses know. Okay. So briefly about symptom management. So ideally when someone's come on towards the end of their life. So this is good clinical practice by nice guidelines. We should have injectable medications in place to help manage any anticipated symptoms. We may already be aware of symptoms that someone may have. So they may have long standing pain, for which some medication, they may have nausea, they may have other symptoms that we have been managing in the community anyway. So if we know that, we should be getting these medications in place. And typically we will get an opioid. So normally it would be morphine first line or oxycodone, and that would be for management for pain or for breathlessness. We usually get an anti-sickness in. We usually get an anti-anxiolytic such as midazolam as first line. And we usually get an anti-secretory to help with those oral secretions. Um, there are other medications we may use to help manage other conditions at end of life, but those are our, our standard four that we would get in. And if we're needing to use injections or if someone's on a lot of medication orally that they're not going to be able to take, such as long acting morphine um, or oxycodone, then we need to think about setting up a continuous infusion, which would be our syringe driver. So just to go, oh, I've skipped ahead. Just to go over a little detail, so, so morphine 2.5 milligrams subcut up to two hourly will be our starting dose. Obviously, if someone's already on oxycodone um, because they haven't been able to tolerate morphine, or if they've got a mild to moderate renal impairment, then we usually go for oxycodone and again, it'd be 2.5 milligrams. There are other medications that we use and there's guidance on the symptom uh, management um, appendix part of the care decisions. So if you're unsure, do have a look at that as well, so, because there's some great information there. If you've got someone on a patch, so fentanyl, buprenorphine patch, please don't take it off, OK? This is managing their background pain. We're going to use the additional medication on top of the patch. So change it as it should be, whether it's every three days or a week, and make sure that's continued. For management of breathlessness, again, we use morphine or oxycodone and we use similar doses. And um, we can use midazolam alongside because, uh, as we discussed in the breathlessness teaching, People often have an element of anxiety when they're feeling breathless. So a little dose of midazolam goes a long way with that. With agitation, we usually first line, we use our midazolam. If we think there's more of a delirium related agitation, then we'll usually use haloperidol. And if you need second line agitate medication to help with agitation, first the next one would be levomipromazine. That's a handy one to get in the community as well, because actually on lower doses, it's a very good one to help manage complex nausea and vomiting. So sometimes we'll often put that as a second line one um, if you think you're going to struggle with some of the symptoms in the community. I want to, I will come on to the other symptoms as well, but I think it's really important to mention as well some of our non-pharmacological methods of managing people's symptoms at the end of life. So please remember, think simple things like repositioning, the amount of times you could have someone who's in pain or discomfort or struggling with their breathing and getting them in a much better position and a good tweak of the pillows makes a huge difference. If you've got someone who's feeling breathless, continue the fan therapy. Make sure it's a bit chilly today, maybe not today, but generally opening windows and make sure there's fresh air. Reassurance, holding someone's hand and speaking to them and giving them reassurance is really important. Um, obviously, make sure that people's bowels are opening so they're not getting constipated, that they're not in urinary retention. It's really important because obviously that will add to any pain or agitation. And I've got a little note there about considering oxygen for hypoxia related breathlessness. So we don't use it all the time for management of breathlessness. Usually morphine and the midazolam and the reposition is more than enough. But if you've got someone who's already got oxygen in the property and actually 
that they are feeling breathless, it does no harm to stick the oxygen on. But what I wouldn't do at the end of life is go chasing numbers. So I wouldn't necessarily be led by mentioning the oxygen sats. OK, just wary of the time there. So nausea and vomiting. So first line will be our cyclazine. Um, and obviously we can use that up to three times a day. Sometimes you can use haloperidol. Um, like I said before, we've got the levomipromazine there as well. So we generally use 6.25 milligrams um, up to QDS um, to help manage uh, complex nausea and vomiting. If you've got someone who suspected subacute bowel obstruction, we may use metoclopramide. Um, so that's, but we tend not to be keen on that as a one-off subcut injection, just because it's quite a big, it's two mils. So it's a big injection for someone to have at one time. And then for our management secretions, we'll normally be hyacinth hydrobromide for our first line. It is quite sedating though. So if you've got someone who doesn't want to be sedated, or you've uh, got someone maybe at end stage heart failure or end stage renal failure, then we we'll usually go for glycoperonium. I think it's really important to be aware as well that a lot of our medications we're using at the end of life can cause dry mouth. And also people generally mouth breathe at the end of life. So good mouth care is really important. Using things like just general fluid, pineapple juice, a flavor someone's likes, if you want, to, if they think they would like the final taste of scotch, stick it on a toothbrush, baby toothbrush, go around the mouth. If it gives that person pleasure, that's fantastic. But good oral mouth care is really important. Um, obviously, if there's signs of thrush that could cause them discomfort, so a bit of nice statin again, going around the mouth, make sure that's nice and clear. That's really important. If you've got someone on uh, who's got significant renal impairment, I would liaise with your specialist palliative care team. Usually we can use a lot of the same medications, but we're likely to need much smaller doses because the body's not able to clear it in the same way. Um, and there are some extra tips which again are in the um, appendix of the symptom management part of the care decisions, but things to be aware of like avoiding cyclosine and heart failure. Um, you may want to consider diuretics at the end of life if someone's got significant heart failure and we're managing breathlessness. You know, you can liaise with the, the heart failure team for that as well. Um, if you're ever unsure, to do, do liaise with the specialist palliative care team. One thing I always like to make people aware of, if I'm seeing someone and they're on regular oral anti-epileptics, is that when that person's coming towards the end of their life and they can no longer manage those oral medications, we are going to have to put them into a syringe driver. And usually at the end of life, although you can get Capra as a subcut and you can give it as, an, as a continuous infusion, 90% of the time we're going to be using midazolam and it's going to be a big dose, 20 to 30 milligrams, which is likely to sedate someone. And it's being open and honest with the family so that they expect it ahead of time. And hopefully if, a, if the team's been involved beforehand, you know, I will usually warn families that when it comes to that point, we will be sedating your loved one, but it is to prevent any seizures from occurring. So they understand the rationale why. OK, just a brief little demonstration. So that's the All World's Guidance, Care Decisions for the Last Days of Life. It just rolls off the tongue there. So it's a great bit of guidance there that can help support um, us as healthcare professionals. It help, It is designed around the five priorities of care for the dying person, um, and it helps make sure that we're getting everything in place to help support that dying person. And that's it. We've got one chance to get it right. And that's it from me. Jenna, thank you so much. I'm Piana Rollins and standing in for Joe. Very good to be on the call and thank you so much for the um, for the real whistle stop but comprehensive collection of things to think about and everybody at the end of their life is unique aren't they and their story is unique and for the families they are unique and and that phrase we have just they, we do this once as far as we know in this lifetime so it's the little things that people will really remember the touch of the hand uh, the just being there yeah. and it's such a team sport it's such a team activity we we can't do it without all the people who are on this call and lots of colleagues who aren't so thank you i put a link to the care decisions in the chat there for people to be able to go directly to the nhs bit of the website 
um, and there are some the evaluations for the for the session so far there on the screen. Katrin, if you're happy just to stay on the call so that we can um, hear from Sean and hear from Karen, but then we will be just collecting our thoughts together as in the previous four webinars at two yes. o'clock, just to stay on a bit longer. If Absolutely. That's okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Without further ado, I'm going to move on to say, so this is a team activity. So, Sean Tucker, please come and um, give us your experience. And folk on the call, Sean is unable to stay at two. So if you've got particular questions for Sean, then do please put them in the chat as, as she's going through as she's going through her, her session. So, Sean, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Fiona. Um, hi, so my name's Sean. I'm the clinical nurse manager for Marie Curie um, across South East of Wales, but I'm going to do a quick sort of whistle stop tour around uh, the Marie Curie Hospice at Home service. I'm just going to pull up. Is that sharing with you guys? Has it worked? Yeah. Perfect. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Thank you can you. press the press the that's the one. Off you go. <laughs> Lovely. So um, our team then is made up of 22 healthcare assistants who've all had sort of specific palliative care training and sort of recognising end of life symptoms that sort of Caprion has just gone over. Uh, we've got two senior nurses in the Cardiff team. We've got a part time senior nurse, Sarah, and we've got a full time senior nurse due to start in the new year. Um, and then we've got our nurse and service facilitator, Gemma, and then myself who oversees the services across the southeast. Um, so what we do, so we support people um, with terminal illness whose preferred place of death is at home and they meet the CHC fast track criteria. We look, work alongside the district nursing teams to ensure good patient care and we update um, the district nurses regularly with any changes and stuff with the patient. Um, we provide emotional support to both patients and their families' carers and signpost them to the appropriate services. And we provide double-handed multi-visit um, service during the day, so like the package of care side of things. And then on the ad hoc basis, we do an overnight respite um, just to give families and sort of the, those people who are important to the patients some time to recuperate so they can carry on within their carer's role. Uh, and as the sort of title says we cover the whole of Cardiff and the Vale. So who can make a referral to us? So the district nurses can refer to us directly. Um, we've got the palliative clinical nurse specialist, so city hospice nurses, the Marie Curie CNS team um, and the hospital CNSs, discharge liaison nurses and the Marie Curie hospice staff. However, um, in order for us to be able to accept patients from either the hospice or the hospital, um, they will need to have spoken to the district nurses because every patient we go to needs to have district nurse input. Um, otherwise, we can't accept the patient. And equally with the community referrals, we go through the nurse assessors to make sure they're happy that the patient is suitable for our service. Um, so the referral process is quite straightforward. You would contact the local office uh, Monday to Friday, nine till five to check for capacity and the care needs will be discussed and agreed. And then uh, the referral will complete the form and return it to the NHS email at the top of the form. And then we will allocate the care and get in touch with the family then to introduce the service and let them know what time of their visits and what we can offer to support them. Um, if we don't have any capacity, we do pop um, patients' names and details down onto our waiting list. And as soon as um, capacity does become available, we then get in touch with the relevant person, whether it's the DLN, the CNS or district nurses and so on. So we do ask, um, as we are a small service, um, we do ask um, district nurses if the patient um, stabilises and we aren't really deemed as appropriate for um, appropriate service at that point for that patient, then we will ask the district nurses to do a review and then the nurse assesses to look for an alternative um, package of care just to enable capacity within the service because we are, as I said, quite a small service and to free up capacity for others who may need the service at that time. But if somebody is transferred over to another package of care, 
um, they can always be re-referred re at a later time if we become more suitable at that point then to take over the care again. And that is our service, well, in a nutshell. <clears throat> Fantastic, thank you, Sean. And I think your point about um, the point about capacity is so well made, and it's so great to hear that. You know, I mean, because sometimes, as as Katrina was saying last week and this week, sometimes prognostication isn't that easy. And actually, with with when people particularly transferring out from hospital or hospice back into the community, they're back at home, they've got their loved ones around them. Sometimes the situation which has seemed really bleak actually then does stabilise. Um, yeah. So I guess I guess part of the art, though, is in as you're uh, involved with people for the first time, it's for all of us to actually to, to set that expectation as well. There may come a time when... You know, we, we almost we need to we need to take things a step at a time. It's probably the better way, the probably better yeah. way of, of saying. And it's as, usually just making sure that we inform the families as well that you know there is potential for review if things improve and stabilise. Because yes. uh, quite often they don't like losing us. <laughs> well, I think that's uh, no. I, I, well, I think that's right. Well, partly also because you, you know, you will have been involved at that point of almost sort of maximal transition and potential crisis, won't you? And so, people people like to hang on to their safety nets. Um, but part of that, I guess, is for us in the community, whether it's us as a specialist powder care teams or district nursing colleagues or yourselves, it's us, perhaps if things do stabilise, trying to help families to establish what they could put in place or what other things might be available to bridge that gap, because you are a, you are a finite resource. There, as far as as far as we know, you can't you can't double up and make fifteen copies of yourself overnight. So, no. you know, there there the, there is a finiteness, finite, finite bit bit of that resource. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. Really helpful to know. Does anybody on the call have any questions for Sean? Um, while she is still here, because she needs to go off to attend to other things fairly soon. Sean, if people think about things or if in our sort of informal catch up um, at the end, then would you be happy if we emailed you if people have got particular questions? Would that be OK? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Fantastic. Wonderful. Great. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to finish off this final um, webinar of these series right, by really bringing in the, the key part of what happens next and how bereavement fits in to this picture. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Karen onto the call, a colleague from City Hospice. Karen, the floor is yours. Um, please fill us in with your, your, your part of this picture. Thanks, Fiona. Um, yeah, so... I'm the manager of the counselling services at City Hospice. I've got a few slides for you. I will hopefully uh, resurrect them from my uh, computer. We need some, I've, I've said this all the way through the pandemic. We need elevator music at this time yeah. while, while the yeah. technology, <laughs> there you go. Of lounge music going on. <laughs> there you are, you're on, you're on Karen. OK, so we come in not always post bereavement because um, at the hospice we do offer, uh, you know, counselling to uh, the patients and to the pre bereaved the, the families in when they're in their anticipatory grief stages. Um, I think the main thing when we're talking about grief um, is grief is not to be treated like an illness. You know, grief is quite normal majority of grief will be absorbed in the family um, and they don't need any form of therapy or counselling um, and we do need to consider sometimes whether counselling can be harmful uh, and in reality yes it can be harmful if we were to sit with somebody and make them talk about things that they don't want to do hopefully no one in my team would do that um, but I think it's it is something that I've come across in the past where people can you know, almost be re-traumatised or traumatised 
um, by what's happened um, in the bereavement process. Um, I'm trying to move on to two, but it's not letting me. Oh, hang on, there we go. OK, so the factors might influence um, someone's grief response is their social, economic and environmental factors. Um, you know, the, the, the consequences of someone dying can be enormous for, for some people and not for others. So we do have to consider that. Um, the type of relationship that we were involved with, you know, is it going to impact their day to day living? The quality and quantity of their own support networks. Um, some people can get quite um, marginalised almost if they've had a long stint of caring for somebody. Um, and they can lose touch with colleagues at work or friends and family. Um, so we need to think about, you know, what support networks they've got in place and if we even need to build that. Cultural issues also come into play um, at this time. Um, family rituals and cultural rituals for illness, dying and death can really make or break somebody um, at, at, a, at a difficult time. We also consider the financial resources and how this impacts on someone's grief um, because the additional worries and losses involved in the bereavement um, can affect how someone's going to react. We also look at the characteristics of the dying person, sorry, the person that's grieving, um, their overall health um, and any previous health issues. Um, Sometimes we're in a situation where we've got mutual caring going on. Um, so, you know, the, someone that's uh, grieving could have lost their companion or even carer. The amount of energy depletion that they've suffered over the final weeks or days um, leading up to somebody's death um, can have a, you know, a psychological impact as well. You now, have they lost sleep? Uh, lack of exercise, um, all the things that uh, can affect somebody in the in those few days and weeks leading up to somebody's death um, has an impact. Um, there can be excessive or reoccurring use of drugs and alcohol, you know, cigarettes, food, things that people use for comfort uh, and, and that type of older indulgence can affect somebody's health as well, also uh, their psychology. We also need to make sure that people are eating and drinking sufficiently. Um, uh, all you medics amongst us will know that lack of a liquid can uh, affect the way people think. The other sort of things that surrounding illness and the types of death that we have um, is the grievous, you know, the fear of death. How do they think about the mortality or how much did they know? Um, a bit like Catriona was saying earlier, the knowledge, uh, people understanding what's going on at the time of death, what's going on with the illness, um, actually does really help uh, when it comes to the time of grief. The length of time a person has been ill um, can also affect, you know, the anticipatory grieving. If someone's been ill and, you know, the wonderful job that they do at Marie Curie, if people have been in and out of the hospice, the family can then kind of get this sort of idea of immortalization that people have, you know, they've been there once and they've recovered and come back out. So that can affect someone's grieving process. Uh, things that have happened during the illness, where the person has died, was it considered good or bad? How well were they cared for? Um, unfortunately, some people do get taken into acute care, which might not be, you know, what everybody had in mind and what was planned at the time. Um, we also need to consider how many losses they've already had. So that's not just losses and bereavements, um, losses in addition to bereavement. So um, there's lots of losses that might have happened, loss of status, loss of jobs, um, potentially loss of income, loss of house. Uh, and this can all lead to more complexity in the grieving process. I'm sure you're all familiar with the kubler rosses five stages of grief. Um, I'm not a total fan of Kubler-Ross um, and this has been developed now into seven stages. Uh, I think what we do need to understand in the grieving process is that the stages are not linear as often suggested. 
um, shock, anger, denial. Um, it can come to play with anything and at anybody. Um, so sometimes anger and frustration can be shown towards professionals that are working with the family. I think in my experience uh, of working in this business for a long time, grief tends to be a little bit more complex um, and there, there is no linear process to it. I thought this diagram was a little bit uh, more descriptive. Um, Worden's task of the morning, I think, is a is quite a good process to look at, accepting the reality of loss, working through the pain of grief. It's it's helping people understand that actually grief is painful, and it's giving them permission to to you know to to feel the pain of that. Um, Worden also found out from grieving people what it was like to be grieving rather than being told how they should feel. Racing through this a bit now, looking at the time. <clears throat> um, this is a, a really good kind of pyramid of care that was developed um, in the Irish network, actually. Um, and it's looking at the needs and the services, knowledge and skills around grieving people. Um, the majority of people will not need any other care than their family and support networks. Um, they've maybe anticipated the, the bereavement um, and, and are well cared for beforehand. Even if they haven't had anticipatory care, um, some people come to us very and, and die, you know, the, the family die very quickly. Um, so there's, there's not that preparation in place. Um, there are other people that will just be supported by odd conversations with nurses, doctors, um, by bereavement support. Um, they need they don't really need much more than that. You know, coffee mornings, meeting other people that have uh, lost loved ones. We're then looking at more therapeutic services for the more complexity of the grief um, that's going on, thinking about, you know, things that can influence grief. Um, and then we've got level four, which is more specialised therapeutic care, um, which is more your sort of psychotherapy and counselling uh, specialist services, which some people will need. Um, and it will depend very much on their resilience, coping strategies and other influences that have uh, come into play with their grief. Um, just thinking about children in the process, there's often children around, whether they're children or grandchildren. Um, children understand death very differently and it will depend on their age and cognitive development. Younger children, um, even quite small babies, will know if their main care is not there and it can make them quite fractious, but clearly they don't understand that someone could have died. Death is usually understood round about the ages of seven to ten. And at that age, depending on the cognitive ability of the child, they will understand that someone can die and they will not come back. Before that, they tend to understand that the, that someone can die, but they think they will come back or they've gone somewhere. Um, I usually feel it's a much harder time for our young people, our teenagers. Um, they understand more what they're losing. Um, I think when you're talking to children and or talking to anybody really is to be honest and don't assume you're the expert. So once all the expert is, guidance is needed with the medical care, uh, we're now looking at psychology and support. Um, and certainly with children, don't assume you're the expert. expert. Um, find out what they know, what do they think has happened or what do they think is going to happen. Um, certainly for children, and I often think a little bit in adults as well is when you're faced with mortality, when you've when they've seen that, the first question is, is will I die? Um, you know, the, we, we're faced with it. Often, most of the time we go through life not realising that people actually do die. So when they do, it's will I die? Will they come back uh, for children who will feed me and for some adults, maybe? Um, we tend to have in psychology, we tend to have biological discussions rather than spiritual um, and only give information that a child or person can handle at that time. When someone's grieving, what people need, I'm often asked, you know, what do we say to people? We don't often need to say anything. What we need to do is listen and just to hear somebody. Um, and we listen to actually hear what someone says. 
often when we're listening to people, we're listening and we're searching for our own response so we can offer guidance or fix something. Um, in, in the initial stages of grief, we cannot fix anything. Um, so we can just listen, um, acknowledging what someone is experiencing and just sit with them so they're with somebody if you're the only person present. Um, so I'm part of the Welsh Government um, National Framework um, for Delivery of Bereavement Care in Wales. Uh, and we've been working on that for some time now. Um, I've put the link to the guidance um, in this on the slide. Um, but that really is helping us all to think about um, that there's always somewhere for someone to go when someone's bereaved. And it's pulling together NHS and charity providers um, in bereavement care. Um, city hospice uh, offer bereavement care for everybody in uh, Cardiff. Um, that's whether they've been known to the hospice medically or not. Um, but we will follow up all our patients um, to make sure that they feel supported uh, and there's guidance and help there if they need that. Um, everybody can get referred into the service and what we will do is an assessment to make sure what they, the level of care that they need um, so they're not put into places that they don't need or given, you know, just group support if that's what they want or individual care um, if we identify that as a needed um, support. So there we are, that's the evaluation um, that I've been asked to put on. Uh, Fantastic, Karen, thank you so much. Um, and I don't know if people want to put any questions or reflections in the chat. I think it can be it can be really interesting out there as any part of somebody's palliative care journey, whether you're seeing people right at the end of life or earlier on, as we talked about through the through the series of webinars. And some families are already thinking about how they will approach the immediate period after somebody's died and, and sometimes have questions around grieving. Other people don't. For some people, that's OK. They have their normal coping mechanisms and their the way that they've been. They, they've kind of they sort of know what to expect. Other people, other people might not. And I, I, I think um, I think it's the individualness of the grief reaction for everybody just makes it complicated and if you have a complicated death at some point you might have coped quite well with bereavement up to a point and then in your life and then suddenly there's a difficult one and then that kind of impacts on 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 everything i was struck yesterday somebody on the news there was you know somebody had died at age 97 and and the, the immediate response was oh, i was i was i was i was gutted i was surprised they died and i was sitting there thinking well yes yes probably she was 97. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I think that's right, right, Fiona, because in anticipatory care, um, a lot of people can get prepared for the death. And I think good anticipatory care, you know, is really important, but we can only give people the information that they want to hear. And some people don't want to really think about what goes on beyond. Um, and, you know, the sort of compounded bereavements. And we've seen a lot more multiple bereavements at the moment just because of COVID, um, mm. which adds a further complication to things. So we can have quite a um, a good death, uh, you know, our 97-year-old grandma, um, and then people can you know, absolutely go to pieces. But mm. it's because of other things that have happened, you know, and they've coped well through COVID and coped well with the bereavements and losses in COVID and not being able to see people. So that can be, it really influence how someone's going to react. And I think your point about uh, actually just listening is, is, is really important. But it can be very tricky if you're a healthcare professional who hasn't necessarily managed death in anybody close to you and you're then working and, and it happens. And I think the compassion in all of us makes us want to say things like, it'll be okay and and actually in that immediate certainly 24 48 hours that it that the that immediate moment um have you got any suggest what 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 how do you handle that situation what do you 
What do you not say, okay. if you see what I mean? What do I not say? Oh, mm. <laughs> or, or, or how do you, what, what sort of phrases could you use to stop yourself from saying, I'm sure it'll be OK? Um, I think, mm, what do I say? I usually wait and hear what they say. <clears throat> I don't often say, oh, it's going to be OK. I often say things mm. like, um, you know, we need time to process you know, um, and we need time to think about what's, um, you know, how how they're managing in that immediate moment. So often psychologically, people get quite inward thinking and they can only really think about their own needs at that time. Um, so saying it could be OK is a very global thing because ultimately it will be. But really, we need to think more about how are they processing things? How are they going to get home? How are they going to manage that evening? You know, really bring it back to them and how they're going to manage. Um, have they got somebody that they can call? Um, you know, can they be referred to a service? You know, that, that type of thing that's kind of going to, you know, help them think about themselves because that that's kind of what they're going to be doing at that time. You know, any you know time of crisis, people time time to go quite inward. Um, but it's thinking more about that immediacy of the situation of how they're going to manage that day and not looking ahead because they can't even go that far. Mm -hmm. And I think I think, again, that the points about children are terribly, terribly well made because it's it's their it, it's their people that the child's ability to process, doesn't it? I mean, I've, it changes according to age and I've certainly had some wonderfully surprising conversations, but yeah. but the, but the, the I think sometimes I've also talked with parents of children to alert the parents to the fact that, that children of, you know, the youngsters age, particularly sort of around five, six, seven, may say very blunt things just because that's how they see the world and they're not deliberately trying to be difficult or upsetting but sometimes to prepare and to remind folk that children will think in a different way can be helpful as well can't it absolutely and they do think in a very different way I mean, when we talk about grief in children especially that age group we often talk about it as like muddles and puddles you know they they will <laughs> jump into grief and get really upset and then by the time you've gathered yourself up and decided what to say, they, they've moved on, you know, yes. <laughs> they're doing something else. So they they think in very sharp thoughts, really. Um, and it's trying to keep up with them, really, and not, you know, if you sit with them and make them go back to something again, that's, you know, we've got the re-traumatisation and, um, you know, it's really mm. meet, meeting them where they're at, I guess, is, is the essential part, certainly in early grief. There are a number of very sort of clever storybooks. I mean, when I was starting off in this field, it was it was things like um, dragon them, the dragon dragonflies and butterflies, and and uh, there's, there's there's a mole story. Have have you got a favourite collection of stories that you storybooks for children that you feel does the subject really well? We do have a number of books actually at the hospice that we give to children and there's badgers parting gifts and things Excellent. like that. There's mm. lots of really nice books for young children. Um, there's not many for older children and there's very few books for anticipatory care. And there's a really nice book as well that the big C um, that helps children think about, um, you know, people who have died with cancer. Um, and there's another book um, um, called Sad. And it's got a big smiley face on it. And it says, you know, people can be sad, but still smile. And that's quite a nice one. But again, for younger children, for for bigger kids, maybe Winston's Wish. There's a website called Winston's Wish, which is like a blog. Um, so they can talk to other people. That can be quite helpful. Uh, so there are quite a few resources out there. Um, and of course, the difficulties for teenagers is they kind of know more what they've lost and also going through difficult stages in their life. Um, which is you know they're very inward thinking as well um so so their panic can be lots of different things you know they've got grief and hormones to deal with <laughs> thank you so much for that i'm aware of time we will stay on the call for a little bit longer but i don't know katriona if you've got anything else that you want to quickly say before people head off to their days and if people have got any other questions do please add them to the chat I think the I want to say is just to remember if you were there for the collaborative work in that, as Fiona said, we're all a big team. If you're ever unsure, 
then reach out to someone. If you're concerned that someone's perhaps approaching the end of life and you don't know what to do next, then reach out to your GP, reach out to your colleagues and reach out to us in palliative care. Um, and, you know, if they're not already known to us, we're very happy to support you with any questions or concerns you may have. Thank you. Point well made. And Joe, anything else from from you at this point? Um, no, nothing specific. Um, just wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers from today for that main part of it. So for so Katri Onassis and Karen Fenner, who are both from City Hospice, and I know that Sean has gone, but my colleague Sean Tucker from Hospice at Home at Marie Curie. So. Uh, Thank you. And just a reminder from Charlotte, then we've got a link to the evaluation, which is in the chat. So please fill in the evaluation forms for us and then we can um, we can thank you with a certificate of attendance uh, if you wish. Thanks. So I realise lots of people will have to uh, go back to go back to work and thanks for joining.